I just want to thank you so much for the title of this series, Making Classics Better. I love it. I am uh, one of life's positive people and I am an optimist and I really have this as kind of my philosophy for life. I, I really want to contribute to this philosophy and this, this mission to make classics better. And I think that one way we can do that is through collaboration. So that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. A lot of the work I do is with people who are considering introducing classics to their school curriculum. So I want to start with an illustrative example this afternoon. I'd like you to imagine that you're this teacher. You are sitting in your classroom. You might have watched a TV program where somebody has been talking about the ancient world and you are inspired. You might have listened to a podcast where somebody has mentioned something that you found fascinating and you think, right, I've got the bug. I want to know more. How do I bring a little bit of this into what I'm doing in the classroom? So you start where a lot of people start with Google. Now there are other search engines, but let's face it, they're just not quite as good. So you Google introducing classics. Seems a sensible thing to do, right? What comes up? The Classical Association. Okay, so you're this teacher and one of the first things that comes up is the Classical Association. You think, right, what is this? Um, right, there's uh, a, a, looks like an old statue of a woman with kind of fancy earring, right? Uh, a dolphin, okay. Um, publications, events, grants, ooh, money. Good, don't have a lot of that in school at the moment. Branches, right? Membership shop, hmm. Uh, for teachers, for students. Well, I'm a teacher, so I'll go to the for teachers bit. So I'll click on that and see what happens next. But also on the list, classics for all. Right, classics for all. Nice. Get involved. My school wants classics. Brilliant. Introducing classics. That's what I want. Awesome. News and events, reading room, what we do, who we are, why support us. Maybe this is where I need to go. But also what comes up. advocating classics education. Classical civilization and ancient history for everyone. We are a UK wide project to extend qualifications in classical subjects across the secondary sector. So maybe this is what I need. Right, community events, introducing classics. So this is why this website has come up clearly because I googled introducing classics. So maybe this is the one that I should focus my attention on. But this one also came up. Right, so the Roman society. Well, it turns out that actually that TV program that I watched last night was all about the Romans and I actually found the Romans really quite fascinating. So what does this one do? Well, this one encourages Roman studies by offering grants and promoting the teaching of Latin in schools. So what do I do with this one? Well, there's a tab that says grants and prizes and then another tab that says schools and resources. So maybe I need to go here. Or maybe it's this one because this is the Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies and this one is the leading organisation for the study of Greece, so it says. So that podcast that I listened to was all about the Greeks and this is the leading society for the study of Greece. So maybe I should start here. Now, what did they do? Well, it turns out if I go to the grants that, that they give grants for the study of Greek and Greece cult, Greek culture, in schools and they promote the study of Greek and Greek culture in schools. So maybe I should go here. But if I'm a primary school teacher, 
then maybe I should go to the primary Latin project because it supports teachers and schools by providing training and resources for teaching Latin and ancient Greek, even though it's called the primary Latin project. But then there's classics and communities which promotes the teaching of Latin and ancient Greek in primary schools and it tells you all about what it does. And then there's the Association for Latin Teaching. What do they offer? Well, what do they not offer? Looking at the list. So if you're that teacher, sitting at the computer <laughs> and you googled introducing classics, just spend five minutes <laughs> before the bell goes thinking, what will I do? Well, <laughs> you might feel like this. Because actually, the classics education landscape is fragmented in the UK. And we have a number of organisations which offers support to teachers looking to introduce or enrich or extend or augment the teaching of classical subjects in schools. But you almost need to know a lot about the learning and teaching of classical subjects in schools before looking to each of these organisations to understand what it is they do. So, if you're new to the teaching of classics, this can feel very confusing. And this is what teachers say to me. Teachers say it's overwhelming. And this is particularly the case for teachers of history. So I work a lot with teachers of history who think about introducing ancient history to their curriculum. And when they talk about the experience of exactly this, they say it's so unlike the history education community where there is the historical association which is the national subject association and there's the school's history project which offers some exams that's it and for classics it's just so overwhelming i mean it's great that these organizations all want to help but it's confusing so the good thing is that these organisations all have a forum in which they can talk to each other, in which they can collaborate and they can keep up to date about what, what each other is doing. And that is the Classical Association Teaching Board. The Classical Association is the National Subject Association for Classics and twice a year their teaching board meets. And the Classical Association Teaching Board was established in 2015 and it supports teachers of classical subjects and ancient history at all levels. It offers teacher training days, it offers supporting materials and it offers all types of continuing professional development. The members of the Classical Association Teaching Board come from organisations that I've just mentioned. They come from exam boards, there are teacher trainers represented on the teaching board and there are academics from a range of institutions on the teaching board. Teachers from the independent sector, the state sector, state selective and state non-selective are all part of the teaching board. This obviously comes out of the fact that the Classical Association is now representing not just academics, but since the merger of JACT with the Classical Association, the Classical Association has a real responsibility to be the Classical Association for all levels of educators in the UK, including school teachers. So twice a year, there is the opportunity for representatives of all of the organisations that I've just talked about to come together and to share knowledge ideas and to talk about the shape of the classical education landscape in the UK. There is a forum in which these organisations can communicate. And the stakes are high. Collaboration between these organisations is really important. We have to get this right. 
because the state of the study of classics in schools is perilous. This chart shows the decline in the number of presentations at GCSE level in Latin. OK, so Latin is the most obvious one, which is in decline. Classical civilization is also in decline, but it's a less sharp decline. Um, classical Greek and ancient history are more stable, but you can see the numbers for classical Greek and ancient history at GCSE are very low. There is only one exam board offering classical Greek, classical civilization and ancient history at GCSE, and that is not a particularly comfortable situation to be in. There are two exam boards offering GCSE in Latin, um, but these are the combined figures from 2013 onwards. So this is a sharp and worrying decline. It is really important that all of these organisations who are supporting teachers who want to introduce classics and potentially reverse this decline are talking to each other in a strategically effective way. At A level, Latin's in decline, but it's not the subject which is in the sharpest decline. The subject which is in the sharpest decline at A level is classical civilization. Ancient history <laughs> is the glimmer of hope in the current classics education landscape um, and it is actually growing at A level in the UK and that's something we're really happy about and that's something which we're working in partnership with at the Historical Association to hopefully see this trend grow uh, just as sharply as everything else is currently declining. Um, but you know, you can see the stakes here are high. So this is why I think collaboration is so important. We must stem this decline and ideally see the numbers rise. So the one exam board which provides all of these qualifications, so there's only one exam board providing A level in all four classical subjects is OCR. OCR is based in Cambridge and OCR is very keen to collaborate. So I've mentioned already the Classical Association Teaching Board and the fact that it brings together a number of people twice a year and there are 20 plus organisations represented on the Classical Association Teaching Board. There are also subject reps. I forgot to mention that, but there are subject reps on the Classical Association Teaching Board. So there's one person who's the representative for ancient history, one person who's the representative for Latin, the same for Greek and for classical civilization. And they then have a network of teachers across the country whose views they then represent on the Classical Association Teaching Board and their web, their email addresses are on the Classical Association website. So any teachers with any concerns can contact that representative and have their um, views expressed at Classical Association Teaching Board meetings. So that is the CATB. But OCR as an exam board is also keen on collaboration. So twice a year, they convene another meeting called the OCR Classics Consultative Forum. And the purpose of this meeting is for OCR to address assessment specific queries. So this again is a two way thing. So the exam board raises issues which they have identified which are affecting perhaps the growth or lack of it in exams and they want the ideas of the members of their consultative forum and they uh, actively seek those during these meetings. But it's also an opportunity for the members of the consultative forum to speak to the exam board and to raise issues which they have found speaking to the classics community and for OCR subject specialists in classics to take those forward with other members of the OCR team. The members of the OCR Consultative Forum, again, come from a wide range of the classics education community. They are teachers from uh, state schools and independent schools. They are teacher trainers from a range of teacher training establishments, uh, both skits and uh, universities. They are academics, again, from a range of universities. 
And the membership of this consultative forum changes over time, so it's not the same people all the time. I think innovation comes through collaboration and I guess this is the philosophy behind a number of organisations in the classics community who I'm, I have identified as doing good work. So I'm going to share some examples just now which I think are praiseworthy. So thinking about the school sector initially, Advocating Classics Education, Classics and Communities and Classics for All are three organisations which are working hard to innovate through collaboration. I guess these organisations have looked at those worrying trends and they've thought, OK, we need to take some action, but we can't do this alone. We need to work in partnership. So Classics and Communities, Amy has already mentioned, is um, an award winning project which seeks to widen access to the study of classical languages in primary schools. The model here was to work in partnership with universities where universities would host training days for primary school teachers who would be connected with local secondary school teachers who were already teaching Latin, sometimes Greek, usually Latin, <laughs> who would act as mentors and provide professional mentoring and advice and guidance so that these primary school teachers could learn Latin and begin teaching Latin in their classrooms with the support of the local university. This project has been going since 2014 and has reached more than 2000 pupils. Advocating Classics Education is another national project. It has uh, worked in partnership with 16 universities across the UK, seeking to widen access to the study of ancient history and classical civilization. It has benefited from funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and this map shows you the impact that it has had, not just in England, but in Scotland, Northern Ireland, now Republic of Ireland and Wales. So the red pins show you schools where classical civilization or ancient history has been introduced. The uh, yellow stars or the stars with the yellow backgrounds are uh, partner universities and the blue circles with the white squares are locations of teachers who attended a five day summer school upskilling them to be able to teach GCSE and A level classical civilization. So this is a project which brought together universities to work locally and regionally with schools to be able to access the expertise to introduce ancient history and classical civilization in areas where previously none was available on the curriculum. Classics for all is the national charity which seeks to get more classics into schools by raising money from those people who think that classics should be available in schools and giving it to state schools via um, free training and resources. And this is their impact map. You can see across the country they've managed to get lots of um, training into primary schools and secondary schools again by working in partnership through a local hub coordinator. So they uh, em employ, they pay somebody. This is different from the ACE and the Classics and Communities model where it's done on a pro bono basis. So Classics for All pays a local hub coordinator whose job it is to uh, coordinate the efforts in local areas and to often provide the training for uh, primary teachers or secondary teachers in schools. Uh, I have a book coming out, uh, co-authored with Edith Hall and James Cork Webster, about the work of the ACE project, about the work of collaborating with universities across the country in order to widen access to the study of classical civilization and ancient history. And we hope that that will be out early next year. So we've talked about the 
school landscape, that is the high school landscape for people aged 11 to 18, what is it like in universities? Well, from the most recent statistics and the CUCD bulletin, this is what it looks like for um, UK universities. And it's broken down here into traditional and modern. And I'm aware that we have some people on the call this afternoon who aren't UK based. So my understanding of traditional versus modern is that traditional usually involves the study of an ancient language and modern uh, might be something like classical civilization or ancient world studies. And compared to the school charts, uh, these look altogether more encouraging. I mean, there has been a slight decline in the modern single honours and the um, traditional single honours, but nothing like a steeper decline as the study of classical subjects in schools. And I think we have got CUCD in part to thank for the coordinated efforts of the overview of the field in universities. So for those of you who aren't aware of CUCD, it is the Council of University Classics Departments, and I've taken this just from their website. These are the member institutions of CUCD. Now, when I've been in the US and I've talked about CUCD, people simply don't believe that such a thing is possible. They think, wow, that's incredible. And like this one organization brings these people together and and coordinates the collection of statistics. So you actually know how many people are studying and you know how many people are teaching and you know what type of contract they're on. That's amazing. So I think perhaps in the UK, we don't really always celebrate the fact that we are already collaborating very successfully thanks to CUCD. Is it perfect? No. Does everyone return the information that they're meant to return on time? No. But I think the very existence of CUCD is a collaboration that we should definitely celebrate. As is the bulletin. So the bulletin is just so inclusive. I, I mean, I even think the wording of this page about the bulletin is inclusive. I welcome pieces of various shapes from short reports on pedagogical events and projects through to longer reflective articles. Susan says, you know, just get in touch. Just get in touch if you want to publish something from anyone, early career researchers, PhD students and academic and post, visiting lecturers, early paid staff, the bulletin belongs to everyone. And when you look down the table of contents, you can see that really people from all career stages have published in the bulletin. So I think the bulletin is a great example of a collaborative, inclusive uni university publication. Again, something to be celebrated. And my own experience of publishing in the bulletin this year has been entirely positive. So I would recommend it to everyone. The statistics are superb. As I say, the envy of people in other countries, but they're not complete yet. So um, we celebrated hugely in the 2018-2019 statistics that for the first time CUCD were publishing not only the statistics of higher education but also school, uh, so the numbers of students studying at GCSE and A-level. Brilliant! But what was missing? There was no information about Scottish qualifications. So in terms of ambitions versus realities, um, an ambition would be that for the next publication of statistics, it would be great if we could have information from the Scottish Qualifications Authority so that we have information about the number of students studying qualifications in classical subjects. It's only Latin and classical studies in Scotland. 
and if we could have a picture of what qualifications, if any, are being studied by students in Northern Ireland, because that information, to the best of my knowledge, is not included in the statistics which are given by OCR. And CUCD are also contributing to larger field-wide collaborative efforts, like the Quality and Diversity in Classics report. So for members of this conversation this afternoon who are not from the UK, I think that we are really blessed by having a collaborative collection of universities who are able not just to get together and talk about operational issues facing classics, but are able to also talk about strategic issues facing the classics community. And this report is an example of one of those strategic larger issues facing the field. It's great. And as you can see from this screenshot, there's also an education committee and the Equality and Diversity Committee also have a blog. So here's a star for CUCD. In terms of collaboration, I think it's great. Moving on to another section of the UK classics community, our colleagues in museum studies have got the classical collections network, where on a, I'm not sure how frequent basis, uh, they get together and are able to share ideas, talk about the future shape of their field, map their collections and identify key priorities. This again, I think, is a great opportunity for people, particularly who are working as loan curators of classical, small classical correct collections or in very small museums to have the opportunity to get together. Thinking about the learned societies, <laughs> classics, I think, is quite unusual. In that we have so many. There are just so many learned societies and professional organisations under the umbrella of classics. And something which I learned last year was that these organisations didn't really have a forum in which they got together and had the opportunity to talk to each other. So as Outreach Officer of the Classical Association, one of my duties is to chair the Classics Development Group. And it seems sensible to me that the membership of the Class Classics Development Group could be one forum in which these learner societies and professional organisations and foreign schools could come together to share knowledge. So I'm really pleased to say that the uh, people or organisations, the logos on the screen at the moment, are now members of the Classics Development Group. We meet twice a year. We had our first meeting in February 2021 and members appreciated the chance to talk about big issues facing the field. So it was decided that for the first meeting, main big issue facing everyone at the moment is COVID and how the pandemic is affecting the classics community. Now each of these organisations had already done something or were thinking about doing something or were on the cusp of announcing something to support their members or the classics community more generally but they weren't all necessarily aware that others were at the same stage. So this Classics Development Group meeting gave them the opportunity to just share with each other, although we've launched a hardship rant round and our awards go up to X amount and our um, application procedure is going to be, oh, well, we thought about that, but we decided not. And so this knowledge exchange opportunity was thought to be really very valuable. And what came out of this was that the Classical Association decided that actually there was a, a significant need within the classics community and the Classical Association committed £75,000 to supporting um, the members of our community in greatest need. We will have another meeting in October this year and the topic 
for conversation is yet to be decided, but it will be a big issue facing the field of classics, where all of these learning societies and professional organisations views will be very important and will contribute, hopefully, to some action. But Classics also has a seat at some big tables. So our collaboration is not just within our own community, it's also within the larger arts and humanities community. So Classics and various classical organisations are a member of the Arts and Humanities Alliance, which has some leverage with policymakers and government. Uh, a number of learning societies are also a member of the British Academy's Learning Societies group, which again has the opportunity to feed some key ideas up the chain, as it were. And the Council for Subject Associations is another way in which classics can advocate for the role of classics, not just in the curriculum, but in society. So I think it's important for classics and classicists to think about our role as collaborators, not just with each other, but also with those outside the classics community, with our friends in arts and humanities, but also with external stakeholders like policymakers. So I was trying to think, OK, if we were to begin to itemise <laughs> who's in the classics community, what could we come up with? OK, and I'm sure I've missed out lots of potential categories, so I'm going to really value your input here. I think under school teachers, we're going to have primary school teachers, secondary school teachers, teachers in further education and private tutors. So far, I don't think any of the organisations that I've mentioned have a private tutor or anybody representing private tutors on any of their committees or boards. So in terms of ambitions versus, versus realities, I think private tutors currently are not represented. Policymakers. So we've got policymakers in devolved administrations and we've got unitary policymakers. So thinking about Whitehall and Westminster. Currently, I think we don't have, well, I have a research and public policy partnership with the Department for Education, but um, we don't currently have any policymaker presence on any of our committees. Teacher trainers definitely are represented on a number of the committees that I've talked about so far, but trainee teachers, I mean, they're only trainees for a year. How are they represented? Higher education academic staff, we have lots of them. Higher education outreach and access staff. So a lot of the higher education academic staff have as part of their job, they are the departmental outreach lead or the departmental webinar participation and access lead. But there are some universities that have a classics outreach officer. I think we should consider whether they are currently included in the organisational structures for the collaborative organisations that we've talked about. Um, students, postgraduate and undergraduate, public engagement professionals, museum and library professionals, charity, professional organisation and learning society staff, and then professional staff. And I think this could include a lot of people, um, theatre practitioners, archaeologists, authors, publishers, educational content producers. They are always thinking people um, who make videos or um, podcasts and then examination and qualification bodies. This organisation, the Women's Classical Committee, I think do a brilliant job. I've been, I'm a member and I've been to a number of I've been to a number of events. And in terms of targeting a cross section of this, I'd say the Women's Classical Committee, in my experience, probably get closest to including somebody from all of these. They have had at the events that I have attended students, school teachers, 
early career staff, mid career staff, senior staff. They have a mentoring scheme which connects senior staff with mid career staff and early career staff. They have had um, professionals, theatre producers and theatre practitioners at their events. They are inclusive. They um, positively welcome people who have caring responsibilities to come and bring um, children with them if they need to. They operate in a very transparent way where they, if they have vacancies, for example, when they're recruiting school teachers to their committees, they uh, advertise and say exactly how the, the elections to those roles are going to be conducted. So I think if we're looking for a model of how we can collaborate successfully across the UK classics community, Women's Classical Committee is a good place to look. Something I'm trying to do, as Amy explained in the introduction, is to connect some groups who I think, in my experience, would like to work together, but um, haven't previously had the opportunity to do that. So I have been successful in getting some money from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to connect museum staff with exam board staff, with teachers and with some community organisations. So uh, this project hasn't moved quite as swiftly as I would have liked because museums have been closed because of the pandemic, but I'm hoping that uh, this will help particularly exam boards be able to interact with those stakeholders and uh, could be a model for collaboration in the classics community moving forward. And thinking about students, um, the organisations that I've spoken about so far, I'm not sure the extent to which undergraduates are really welcomed on committee structures. Now, again, you know, they're there for three years. Um, are they invited to be members of those committees? I'm not sure. But what I do know is that undergraduates have a huge amount of energy and enthusiasm, and some of them are just getting on and doing their own thing anyway. So Academus, I think, is a brilliant example of a group of undergraduates who themselves felt that the classics community could do a better job of supporting young people in schools who want to study classics at university, but don't yet have the skills that they need to be able to write a compelling personal statement or to do a very good job of interview if they have to interview at that university. So started by some students at UCL, they put on a completely free virtual classics summer school. And these students reached out to academics initially at UCL, but then to academics across um, UK universities. And they have been highly successful. And they're now working in collaboration with students, undergraduate students at universities across the UK who also want to volunteer. And it's all done on a voluntary basis. No money changes hands. They're also now putting on events. So a couple of weeks ago, they hosted a classics outreach conference where they were basically saying classics outreach could be doing a better job. What needs to change? What role can students have? Well, maybe that's a conversation that some of the organisations that I've mentioned already could or should be having. But these undergraduates are so energetic and so enthusiastic and so creative they are just getting on with it. And they are collaborating with their peers, but also inviting in academics who they feel have a valuable contribution to make. So my question is, how can we involve them in the classics community at an organisational level? Another organisation which is student run, student led, is London Classics of Colour. They felt that there was a gap. They felt that there was an organisation 
that wasn't there. So they created one. The Christian Coal Society in Oxford for classes of colour similarly felt like, well, academics aren't doing this, so we will. And again, it's this is led by students. So I just wonder what scope is there for the academic classics community in the UK to work in collaboration with undergraduates more. So in teaching, we have a what went well and we have an even better if. So I've talked quite a lot about the realities and now I'm just going to end with the ambitions. So my ambitions for collaboration in the UK classics community are, I think it would be even better if there were more school teacher representation on boards and committees. And you may say, but there's at least one school teacher on the board that I sit on. I'm in the Hellenic Society, I'm in the Roman Society, and there's at least one school teacher, and that's great. But think back to those charts that I showed you of the decline of the study of classical subjects in schools. <laughs> I think if there are any voices we should be hearing just now, it is the voices of school teachers. So if that means that those learning societies or those professional organisations need to pay for half a day of cover so that school teachers can attend those meetings, so be it. I think it would make a real difference if Everybody who were organising or running events in the UK Classics community used one events calendar to promote those events. So, for example, the Classical Association has an events calendar on its website. I don't, I don't think it matters what, whose events calendar we use. I just think for people outside the inner circle of classicists, OK, so for the interested observers, for the teacher at the beginning googling introducing classics if we could just collaborate so that everybody's events were in the one place it would be so much more accessible for people to plan what they're going to attend and what to suggest to their learners their, their high school students to attend um, I think we should be listening more to students. By that, I mean both our um, high school students, but also to our undergraduate and our graduate students because they are the future of the field. Two meetings a year for the Classics Development Group or the Classical Association Teaching Board is not a lot. And I think that we need to find a mechanism to be sharing information and updates between those meetings. And I know that this comes down to workload and I know that everybody who works on these committees is doing it pro bono on top of their normal jobs. And so saying we're going to share more stuff between meetings is just adding to that workload. But that leads on to my next point. I think we need to confront the issue of rewards and recognition. For the people who are doing the work in building and sustaining networks for knowledge exchange. This is work. This isn't fluff. <laughs> this isn't just on the periphery. I would say this is as important as teaching and research. If we want to make classics better, I think we need to value this work. And that is a big strategic question. Another big strategic question is the status of classics education as a field of inquiry. I think classics is really far behind the curve here in relation to other curriculum subjects. Classics has been on the curriculum for a very long time and yet the study of the learning and teaching of classics has not really been taken seriously 
I would say, <laughs> as a field of study in the same way that maths education has or geography education has. And I would point to the complete absence of research chairs in classics education in the UK as evidence for that. Now, thinking back to those charts, with the decline of the learning and teaching of classics in schools, if we want to make this better, we have to invest in the study of classics education as a field. The Netherlands sponsors two teachers a year to do PhDs in classics education. Classics education policy, classics education pedagogy, they can choose. I think we can learn a lot from that example. Now, obviously, there has to be someone in post to be able to supervise those PhDs. At the moment, the people who lead P PGCEs in the UK are teaching focused and not always on permanent contracts. So my exhortation here is that the field of classics makes a strategic investment in classics education as a field of inquiry. And finally, I would encourage us to think of collaboration not as an oracy activity, not just as something that we talk about and discuss, but rather as a route to action. So as Amy mentioned, um, this book was published in 2018 and there are, are actually three chapters in it which focus on collaboration, not just in the UK. There's one which focus, uh, focuses on collaboration in South Africa and one which focuses on collaboration in Australia. And my next next book uh, will focus on changing the narrative about who classics is for. And this one will have a couple of chapters in it about collaboration. One will be on collaboration between museums and schools, and the other will be on collaboration between teachers, social workers, parents, and young people. So this will, I hope, add a slightly new dimension about who classics is for. And I'm very active on Twitter. So if you want to uh, keep up to date with my research and my work to build collaboration in the UK classics community, you can find me at Dr Arlene HH and you can find a couple of research projects that I'm involved with at Class of Ankhist and at Classics and Com. And my own website is drarlenehh.com. So I'll stop sharing now and I uh, look forward to having a conversation. <laughs>